Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Mary Winkler? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Mary Winkler was born in Tennessee on December 10, 1973. She grew up in Knoxville. Her father worked in real estate. Her mother was a teacher. She graduated from high school in 1992 and then attended college, eventually transferring to one in Henderson, Tennessee. Mary was described as a good student who was very religious. Mary would meet a man named Matthew Winkler in college and they would fall in love. Matthew's father and grandfather were preachers and the family moved around quite a bit when Matthew was young. He also wanted to be a preacher. He was described as charismatic and enthusiastic. The pair would marry in 1996. They both dropped out of college in 1997 due to financial difficulties. Matthew found work teaching Bible classes. The couple had three daughters, Patricia, Mary Alice, and Brianna. Mary and Matthew moved to Selmer, Tennessee in January of 2005. Matthew had secured a job as a pulpit minister at the 4th Street Church of Christ. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On March 21, 2006, Mary went to work as a substitute teacher. It was her first day on the job. Her coworkers noticed that she spent a lot of time on break talking on her cell phone. That evening, the family bought food from Pizza Hut and watched the movie Chicken Little. The couple put their daughters to bed at 8.30 p.m., Matthew and Mary had sex and went to sleep. Just after 6 a.m., now on March 22, their youngest daughter, Brianna, woke up crying. Matthew tried to comfort her, and then Mary took over. Matthew returned to bed, but he was aggravated that he had to get up. He viewed taking care of Brianna as Mary's job. After tending to Brianna, Mary went downstairs to start coffee, but then she returned to the bedroom. She made her way to the bedroom closet and retrieved a pump-action 12-gauge shotgun. The weapon was loaded with birdshot. She walked over to the bed where Matthew was sleeping, pointed the shotgun at his back, and pulled the trigger. Matthew rolled out of the bed and onto the floor, mortally wounded. The oldest daughter, Patricia, came in to investigate the source of the shotgun blast. She saw her father face down the floor. He was groaning and asking Mary what happened. The girl asked her mother what happened, Mary told her, Daddy was hurt, and we are leaving. Mary took the three children, loaded them into her minivan, and drove away. Fifteen hours later, after Matthew missed an evening Bible study, church members found his body. The police started looking for Mary and her three daughters, worried that somebody must have broken into the house, killed Matthew, and kidnapped them. The police found the family about 350 miles away in Orange Beach, Alabama. The murder weapon was in the minivan, which made the police rethink the whole mystery assailant theory. Mary was arrested after confessing to the murder. She was extradited to Tennessee and indicted in June of 2006 on charges of first-degree murder. Investigators learned that when Mary left the residence, the phone had been disconnected, like somebody deliberately unplugged it, which certainly made it seem as though Mary didn't want Matthew calling for help. Mary explained to investigators how she did not remember retrieving the firearm. She claimed that she didn't even know her husband had a shotgun in the house. I guess it was just luck or magic that she happened to find the shotgun in the bedroom closet. She said that the next thing that she heard was a loud boom. Matthew turned to her and said, why? Mary responded that she was sorry and that she loved him. I would hate to think what would happen if she didn't love him. Mary dabbed the blood that was coming out of his mouth with a sheet as he was lying on the floor dying. She told the police that she and her husband were arguing about money and said, quote, I guess that's when my ugly came out, unquote. Mary indicated that she had been the victim of a scam, which was tied to what happened. It was the basis for their argument. Mary deposited checks totaling about $17,500 from individuals in Nigeria and Canada into bank accounts that belonged to her and her husband. She had opened several bank accounts in the weeks leading up to the shooting. Mary sent money to these individuals and spent the money that she thought she had deposited 
but the checks were bad. This is a well-known scam. The con artist tells the victim that if they can help them cover bank processing fees, they will send them thousands of dollars. Matthew knew there was some type of financial trouble, but he did not know the extent of the scam. Mary had been on the phone on March 21 with two banks who were questioning her about her role in the scam. This is who she was talking to when she was working as a substitute teacher. The banks threatened to call the authorities if Mary and Matthew did not come in and talk to them. They wanted their money back. Matthew was angry about the money problems, but according to Mary, he started criticizing her for more than just this issue. Mary claimed he was commenting on the way she would walk and eat. Mary reached a limit. She snapped from all this criticism. Interestingly, Matthew would have found out the details of the scam within a few days after he was murdered. This timing seems convenient from Mary's perspective. Mary was represented by a number of attorneys pro bono. During the trial, which occurred in April of 2007, Mary testified on her own behalf in front of a jury comprising 10 women and two men. Mary said that Matthew pressured her to wear costumes during sex. She showed the jury two articles of clothing she was pressured to wear, a wig, and high-heeled shoes. The jury was in disbelief and infuriated. Here's what Mary told them as far as the shooting. She went to the bedroom closet and retrieved the shotgun in order to force Matthew to talk about and resolve their marital problems. What better way to get somebody's attention than a 12-gauge shotgun? I guess this only stands to reason. There is such a thing as a shotgun wedding, so why not shotgun marriage counseling? I imagine this is a service that a marriage counselor could offer. Their slogan could be, blast your way to reconciliation, or tired of racking your brain to fix your marriage? Try racking your shotgun instead. Mary would go on to say that she just wanted Matthew to stop being so mean. While she was holding the shotgun, something went off. She heard a boom. What terrible luck for this couple. Out of all the times the shotgun could have magically discharged, it happened to be during a fight when Mary was angry and pointing the weapon at her husband. Mary ran away because she figured that Matthew would be pretty mad, I guess seeing as how he had just been mortally wounded and all. Mary Winkler was convicted of voluntary manslaughter on April 19, 2007. The jury decided against the charge of first-degree murder, and they didn't go with second-degree murder either. In Tennessee, voluntary manslaughter is a crime of passion produced by adequate provocation sufficient to lead a reasonable person to act in an irrational manner. Apparently, nine of the ten women on the jury wanted to vote for acquittal. It was the other woman and the two men who convinced them to compromise on voluntary manslaughter. So Mary Winkler almost walked on these charges. Because Mary Winkler had never been convicted of a felony, she was facing a maximum of six years. She testified at her sentencing hearing that she suffered the loss of someone she loved, meaning the man that she shot in the back with a shotgun. She was sentenced to 210 days in prison. She was given credit for her time served, which meant that she only had to serve one more week in jail because she was allowed to spend her last 60 days in a mental health facility. After this, she was on probation for three years. In 2008, she ended up winning custody of her three daughters from Matthew's parents. Later, Mary was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The last report I saw in the case indicated that Mary was not working, but she was somehow getting by financially. Now moving to my analysis. Many people thought that Mary and Matthew had the perfect marriage. They represented an ideal. They lived in a parsonage not far from the church with their three daughters and their dog. Matthew was well-liked in the community. Mary was thought of as supportive. There were a few people who were skeptical of Matthew. For example, on one occasion, he threatened to shoot the family dog of a neighbor because the dog was on his lawn. A few other people in the neighborhood believed that Matthew was mistreating Mary. The police were shocked when they first spoke to Mary after the shooting. They said that she was emotionless. She shed no tears. So now we move to this question. Was Mary Winkler actually guilty of first-degree murder or second-degree murder as opposed to the voluntary manslaughter charge for which she was convicted? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea of guilt, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Mary admitted to a few different actions which seemed to point to guilt. She admitted that she was involved in a financial scam and that Matthew knew that she had lost money. They were arguing about the topic. He was going to find out the details of the scam 
Within a few days of when he was shot and killed, Mary admitted that she retrieved the shotgun, pointed the shotgun at Matthew's back, and she admitted the shotgun discharged, although she implied it was some type of accident. She also said that she tried to use the shotgun as leverage in a fight, which of course may not have been true, but this makes it seem as though she introduced a lethal weapon into an argument deliberately. Mary unplugged the phone to make sure that no one would be calling for help. After the shooting, Mary drove to Orange Beach. She paid cash for a hotel room, fuel, and food. She didn't call anyone on the phone. It made it seem as though she was hiding from the authorities. When she was initially interviewed by the police, she said that Matthew had never abused her. She, of course, changed that story later. Several people who knew Matthew said he was not mistreating Mary. According to Mary, after Matthew was shot, he attempted to ascertain her motive. Again, he said, why? If he was harming her, he would have known her motive. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. Two witnesses corroborated Mary's story of mistreatment. They noticed that she was cowering in her husband's presence, and they saw that she had a black eye. She was in possession of the wig and the eight-inch heels, which seemed to support her story about Matthew's preferences for sex. Her defense provided detailed stories about Matthew's wrongdoings. The jury considered this exculpatory, but many of the claims were not corroborated. Here are just a few of the claims. Matthew destroyed objects that Mary loved. He isolated her from her family. She had to have permission to get her hair cut. She walked on eggshells all the time. And she developed PTSD. When considering the evidence, was Mary actually guilty of a more serious crime? I think that she was guilty of second-degree murder. I think the first-degree murder charge is a bit of a stretch considering the circumstances. Again, she was only found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. This doesn't match the evidence. I think what happened in this case is that the jury really identified with Mary. My guess is that the jurors really connected with her various experiences. Specifically, the jury was mortified by Mary's assertion that she had to wear a wig and high heels during sex. This was something they just couldn't seem to get past. Tennessee is a very conservative area. Attitudes toward unusual sexual preferences are more likely to be negative. The jury viewed Matthew as a monster for pressuring Mary into what they considered to be a degrading act. They believed that Mary gave Matthew what he deserved. They believed his behavior warranted death. Mary was only delivering justice. I think another element was Matthew's apparent hypocrisy. Matthew was supposed to adhere to a certain value system that was inconsistent with his desires. He was a phony and, therefore, somehow, in the opinion of the jury, didn't have the same right to remain alive. That's a heavy penalty for being a phony. In this case, the defense was able to shift the narrative from Mary being a killer to Matthew being a villain. I think that Mary may have been mistreated. Again, there's some evidence to support her claims, but I'm highly skeptical that the shooting was consistent with voluntary manslaughter, that somehow she was pushed into an irrational state. The reality is that Mary had options. For example, she could have failed to retrieve the shotgun and failed to shoot her husband. She was not in danger in that moment from Matthew. The situation was not exigent. He wasn't awake or facing her. Yet she behaved in a way as if she was fighting for her life. If her behavior was a reaction to Matthew's wrongdoing, it was a massive overreaction that, in my opinion, rose to the level of second-degree murder. My final thoughts in this case. During an interview, after everything was over, Mary said that her time in jail was too short. She implied that she expected to serve a much longer sentence. I think this is one of those few areas where people would agree with Mary's opinion on the matter. Those are my thoughts on the case of Mary Winkler. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be more exciting than a shotgun blast. Thanks for watching.